Have you ever felt called to do what you thought was impossible to do? I was telling the young people a while back of a time that I felt like I was called to do something impossible. It happened when I was 19 years of age and I had to commit my mother involuntarily to a mental institute. I had to go before the judge and have her committed and then I had to help uh, uh, haul her out of her bedroom and, and out to go appear before the judge. Uh, the youth responded they didn't even know that was an option to commit the mother. Anyway. (laughs) All that's true. But today, the disciples are called, or at least they feel called to something that's just totally impossible. And, And therefore, our opening verse, Luke 17 and verse 5, The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. He replied, if you have faith, now pause there, if there is any condition in the Greek that means it is true. And so you might better translate that since you have faith, or if you have faith and you do, As small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Won't he rather say, prepare my supper? Get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink. After that, you may eat and drink. Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you've done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have done only our duty. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Father, may the word of my mouth, the thought, the meditation, the heart of all here today be acceptable, or in the name of Jesus become acceptable. You alone are our strength, our Redeemer. Amen. Two issues going on here, but we need a context to understand what's being said. The larger context, ever since Luke 15 verse 1 Jesus has been going back and forth addressing first the Pharisees and then the disciples and then the Pharisees and then the disciples. And today he addresses the disciples, but he's including discussion about the Pharisees. Back in chapter 12, he's warned the disciples, beware the leaven, the influence of the Pharisees. And he picks up a a similar theme today about being wary of their influence. And and part of it is their attitude. Their attitude of the Pharisee at this point seems to be, God is lucky to have me on his team. Like when I pray, I might say to God, well, I happen to be in your neighborhood. No, 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 no. Uh, The larger context now comes down to verse 1. Jesus said to his disciples, now pause there. At verse 1, they're disciples. Without looking at the text, what do they call on verse 5? Anybody? Apostles. Verse 1, disciple, student. Verse 5, apostle, ambassador, one who represents a kingdom, a king, a country, or an authority. Why the shift? Has Luke gone senile? No, something's being said here. And at verse 1, they see themselves as students, as learners. Verse 5, they feel like they're called to the impossibility. Jesus said to his disciples, things that cause people to stumble are bound to come. But woe to anyone through whom they come. It would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So watch yourselves. Pause there. 
that's a threat. I don't care if it is the second person of the Godhead, that's a threat. What would cause the God of all creation to threaten us? Intentionally causing a little one to stumble. We're talking age, we're also talking faith. And the reference is the Pharisees who follow God but do so with an attitude that causes problems. Continuing verse 3, if your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times you come back and say, uh, seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. That's the context. What's the impossible life they're called to? Be a Christian. Be a Christian. If you are called of God in a relationship where you are saved, you're called to a life that's impossible except as God works through us. And the disciples hear this idea. Woe if you cause a little one to stumble. Well, what if it was an accident, Jesus? Woe, it would be better for you. And Jesus then goes ahead and threatens us. Uh, well, that takes faith. And then, not only that, I've got to hold people accountable. Can I tell you, in 35 years of ministering for the gospel, I've had one time someone in love held me appropriately accountable. Now, they were totally wrong, but it was in love, and they appropriately did so. A man, and God is my witness, his name was Loyal, Loyal, came to my house and said, are you spending enough time with your wife? He had been hearing of all these events I was doing, and my first wife was paralyzed, and he mistakenly thought she had been staying at home while I was gallivanting around the countryside. When I finished laughing, I said, no, she was with me most of those times. She'd just stay in the van. It was always her choice. But he held me accountable. One of the hardest things we have to do is in love. And, and if it's done, it must be done in love. Hold one another accountable. Now, I was trying to think of an illustration of this point. But to be honest with you, I don't have many. But I do have one. I didn't use it at Parsons because I wanted to use it here. <laughs> I thought I could get away with doing it only once. Somebody in my household, I will not name names, somebody in my household who uh, uses toothpaste by the gallon. I mean, when she brushes her teeth, she brushes it and then spits it out and brushes them again. Came in with breath that was less than pleasant and wanted me to kiss her. And I mentioned that it wasn't totally pleasant. She went back and brushed her teeth again and said, what's it like now? And I said, well, we have to consider these things. Let's keep doing this and make sure that it's holding one another accountable. In turn, I said, now that I did the impossible with you and told my bride, my newlywed, that her breath stunk, you have to tell me. And she said, yes, but I'm waiting. It's hard to tell someone you love that they're wrong. And yet, Jesus said, that's part of the calling of being a Christian. Until we learn to hold one another accountable in love, we're never going to grow. And the point is, after accountability is forgiveness. If seven times a day they repent, you've got to forgive. And that's at the point they think about representing Jesus and say, we need more faith. And what was his response? Well, you may only have a little faith, but a little faith is all you need. If you use that faith, you can do miracles. We have this idea that faith is something that's a, a, a power. I've heard people talk about uh, plugging a light into an electrical socket, and it's like that socket is faith. No. Faith is a person, God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I was watching TV this week, which shows you how bored I am. 
when I get sick. I had to stay in three or four days this week with a stomach bug. And, and so um, was watching the making of the film Star Wars. And they would talk about the force be with you. You remember that? It's like it's an impartial power. And somehow or another, we get to thinking that we need more faith. No, it's either there or it's not. Because faith is not a power. Faith is a person, and it's a relationship to that person. It's a relationship that causes me to believe. It's better to consider an illustration I've used dozens of times, but it's still appropriate. If, I have to, if I've got a stick of dynamite, and I want to light that dynamite, I can use either a match or a blowtorch. Either one will ignite but the dynamite doesn't have more power if I use the blowtorch. It's either present, ignition, or it's not. And today, Jesus is saying, all right, you think your faith is small. Well, all you need is the smallest little speck, and you can do miracles. But the second half of the gospel is, when you do miracles, don't think you've gone the extra mile. The illustration here is, if you've got a servant who serves you, will you then wait on that servant? Well, yes, according to Luke 12. Earlier, we had this passage where Jesus used the exact same illustration in reverse. He says, be watchful. And then he says, if he comes and finds you watchful, well, it'll be like you're the servant who's found watchful and he'll serve you. That's illustrating the goodness of God, the grace and mercy of God. But today he's talking about our attitude and he's warning against the attitude of the Pharisees who have arrogance. When you do use your faith and you do see miracles happen, don't think it's anything above and beyond the call of duty. Just say, ah, it's what I'm supposed to do. Because it's not us that does it. It's God working through us. Back in a previous century, my first wife was quadriplegic. At a point in our life, she had to be staying indoors in our house the entire time she was alive. She was told, the rest of your life you'll need to spend inside the house in order to receive the care you need from the government. Well, about six months after we were doing this, she said, Earl, I'm going crazy. You've got to take me somewhere. And so I told the home health people that uh, for medical reasons, we were having to go out of town. Her mental health was the issue, but I didn't mention that. So I asked her, I said, where do you want to go? She said, well, let's go shopping. I'll take me to Nashville, and then let's go to the beach. Take me to Florida. I said, okay. We had a big blue van, custom built, on a one-ton diesel chassis that then had $30,000 worth of adaptive equipment installed. It had an alternator big enough to power a small city. Had two of the hugest batteries I've ever seen on this thing. But right before we were going to go out of town, I'd had a little electrical trouble, so I took it into the shop, had the alternator rebuilt, had everything, batteries swapped out, everything that it needed, I thought. Got to Nashville, went to the first store, came out, loaded my wife up into the van, started driving back to the hotel, and my front lights went out. And I hit my brakes. I mean, it was dark. And when I hit my brakes, the lights came back on. And when I accelerated, they went off. And when I got off the accelerator, they came back on. So I pulled over, raised the hood, and I could see where the main power supply coming out of the alternator had broken. And it was arcing. Every time it would touch, I'd have headlights. And if I accelerated and it pulled away, well, it had a jagged edge and I could hook it over and we got back to the hotel. Next day was a Sunday. No mechanics available in Nashville on Sunday. It must be a law or something because I called everybody. And uh, I asked my wife, what should we do? And she said, well, you'll take care of it. 
loaded her up and we looked around. I stopped in an auto zone in East Nashville. They had a, uh, an alternator to replace the one that got burned up by the arcing cable, but they didn't have a cable. And so I thought, well, I'll do what I can do. And I remembered scripture, a, a fellow had quoted to me sometime previously from the Psalms, I once was young, but now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaking nor his seed begging for bread. And I'd say that to myself, and I'd say, God has the answer here, I just have to spot it. And all day I'd say to myself, God has the answer here. Well, I would start to work, and every time I needed a new tool, I'd have to clean up. My wife was with me. I'd have to clean up before I'd go back into the auto zone. Guys, if it'd been by myself, it'd been a lot faster. But every time I needed a part, I'd go, or tool, I'd go in and buy it, and, and Berta would make me wash up and clean before I'd go into the store. Got down to where everything was all together except the cable, and there was nothing available. And I kept saying, there's an answer here somewhere. There's an answer here somewhere. And so I started walking around the neighborhood looking for the answer. Came across on a Sunday afternoon at 3.30 in the afternoon, came across a welding supply shop that was open. Walked in, looked around. He asked me, the guy that was running the place, what I needed. And I told him I needed a new cable for my alternator. He said, this is a welding supply shop. <laughs> yeah, but you're open. And I was looking around, finally found a cable end that if crimped on the old cable, and I ripped off the tabs on either side and bent it with a hook, I could get to work. Bought it, started back to work, and realized I needed something to crimp the end. And was so mad because I knew my wife was going to make me clean up again. I was just frustrated. And a boy pulled up alongside me to go into the parts house, and I said, hey, you got a pair of pliers I could borrow? He said, well, I'm sure we could find something. Got in the back of his old truck, started looking, came up with cheap pair of pliers, and said, what you doing? And I unloaded on him and told him the entire story. And before it was over with, he was passing me tools, and we were chatting and talking, and I kept saying to him, there's an answer here. It just... I just have to see it. God's going to provide. We got it all back together, cranked on the first time. It was perfect. The guy said, you know, it's just like a miracle. And he turned around and left. And uh, I cleaned up one last time, climbed in the van and started to leave. And I, I told my wife, I was a bit frustrated. I said, now, baby, you shouldn't have so much faith in me. She said, I was praying. Turned out, looking back, the whole event was so that I could tell this young man, God's got an answer. I just have to find it. And my wife wasn't trusting me. She was trusting the one who I was trusting. She was trusting God. There's an answer here somewhere. But when you've done the miracle, when you've used the faith, understand it's no big deal. You're only doing what God is calling you to do. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our invitation.